Sitting through it last year, and I'm um, very proud to be participating this year. I um, also want to thank Nanha Gallery for making it possible, but also to our panelists for giving up their time and their expertise um, to add to this conversation. Um, I was very honored, I'm very honored to be part of it. Um, I'm following the, I think it'll be an easy role of moderator after seeing the presidential debates, and we will not be having, <laughs> we will have no time to answer to any of the questions, good or bad. Um, when Edward originally gave me the title for this, Issues in Connoisseurship for Collectors of Asian Art, I spoke with the panelists and thought about it for a while and thought to narrow it down to a more ta to a tangible subject, um, and I've come up with the title of the modern connoisseur. Um, connoisseurship is a term that has changed rather greatly over time. Um, dating back to the 17th century, the, the title really had negative connotations. Uh, someone who was aloof, port-sipping, jargon-spouting, monocle-wearing figure, people who cast judgment on art, determining if figures were correct, worth a fortune, or just deplorable fakes. Um, and over time, that role has changed, and thankfully for the better. Um, the role of connoisseur is now an essential facet of many professions in the art world, across a number of areas, from curators, collectors, to art historians, and auction specialists, um, almost all of which are represented here today. It's generally accepted that connoisseurship is co connected with those people who are able to be discerning judges of the best of any field. Today we are going to focus on the current role of the modern connoisseur in Chinese works of art, in three-dimensional Chinese works of art. By learning from our panelists, my hope is for us to gain a better understanding of what tools the panelists have used and what people they have learned from in their current roles in the field to train their connoisseurial eyes and what they see as the main challenges to the modern Chinese art connoisseur now and in the near future. A panel at the Paul Mellon Center a few, few years ago really helped to define the role of the modern or new connoisseurship as maintained emphasis on close looking and a commitment to focusing on what can be learned from the objects themselves. The approach of looking and the history of the specific object itself has changed the role of those people who are charged with assembling museum exhibitions. Martin Myron, lead curator at the Tate, once pointed out that it is not whether or not a painting is by Gainsborough, but how it has and hasn't come to be a Gainsborough over its life, the interesting story that history can tell. In a few minutes, Dr. Maori will speak about a particularly interesting story where such a process played out, which resulted in a major redating of a well-known ceramic group. The process of this discovery is as interesting as the result that it produced. It was reached because of keen observations by Dr. Maori over a number of years. Connoisseurship requires a specific visual knowledge gained from looking at works of art. It requires the gift, the constant exercise of sharp visual memory, and the ability to sympathize with the process of our artistic creativity. Three-dimensional Chinese works of art and paintings each pose particular challenges, as we heard in the earlier panel. A Chinese painting connoisseur will enter the mind of the artist on whose painting they are looking, pondering if the artist would have created that tree branch resembling a crab claw, or if the image is conveying the correct moral message that the artist was looking to include, or generally included. For one to create a visual memory of a Huanhuali bed, which is a virtual six by six foot cube created with hundreds of mortise and tenon joints, one must take a different approach. Later on, Dr. Knight will share with us his experiences with the art of close looking when it comes to Chinese furniture. It is a very different animal than other mediums and therefore has to be approached with a different manner. We're also lucky to have two collectors with us today who have multiple years of collection, collecting experience. They are, Bob and Alice are really in the enviable position of collecting what they enjoyed and what attracted their eyes. Their collections were also influenced by the social and geographical context in which they were collecting at that time. In a way, the Picasses are the ultimate connoisseurs, using their discerning eyes in multiple areas of Chinese art. And with that, I would like to introduce our panelists quickly. Um, Alice Yuan Picas, the wife of Bob Picas, describes her collecting style as an interest in art and art antiques collected by her husband, Bob Picas. <laughs> she does not describe herself as a passionate collector, but likes to buy objects of art that appeal to her and tends to dabble, her worth, not mine, in different fields. In 1985, she was asked by Christie's to start their office in Hong Kong, and in the early 1990s, she was instrumental in promoting 20th century and contemporary Chinese oil paintings in Hong Kong. 
In the mid-1990s, she joined Marlboro Fine Arts to start their business in Asia, selling Western contemporary art in Asia, and representing Chen Yifei in the international market. She and Bob started their retirement in San Francisco in 2000, where they still reside today. Bob Picus is a retired businessman who spent most all of his career overseas. I'm sure a lot of you have met both of them over their retirement here in San Francisco. Most of Bob's years um, working were spent in Hong Kong and include responsibilities from India all the way to Korea. Since childhood, he has been a collector with collections ranging from a boyhood stamp collection to a recent Gandharan sculpture collection. Bob's first posting was to Belgium, a country full of gal uh, galleries, rare bookshops, and stamp auctions, where he began a serious collection of early Belgium stamps, Indian covers, rare books on travel, and early maps of Asia, most of them drawn by cartographers who drew them from tales told by explorers and missionaries. When he had the opportunity to live in Hong Kong, he concentrated on Chinese paintings, classical furniture, Vietnamese ceramics, Tibetan rugs, Japanese screens, and Korean porcelains. His collections of Vietnamese ceramics and Chinese classical furniture were sold by Christie's. Bob has also published a book on Tibetan rugs. Our other panelist, Dr. Michael Knight, is a private curator of Asian art based here in, San, in the San Francisco Bay Area. From 1996 to 2014, he served as senior curator of Chinese art at the Asian Art Museum of San Francisco. Prior to coming to the Asian Art Museum, Dr. Knight spent 15 years in various curatorial roles at the Seattle Art Museum. He also taught for four years at the University of Washington. His primary areas of expertise are early Chinese art, Chinese lacquer, and Chinese furniture. He is also published in the fields of Chinese paintings and calligraphy and Chinese visual art. Some of his exhibitions he was involved with during his museum career in San Francisco, which I'm sure you all know well, are Out of Character, Decoding Chinese Calligraphy, Shanghai, Art of the City, Court Arts of the Ming Dynasty, The Elegant Gathering, The Monumental Landscape of Li Haiyi, Between the Thunder and the Rain, Chinese Paintings from the Opium War through the Cultural Revolution, and Essence of Style, Chinese Furniture of the Late Ming and Qing Dynasties. Our last panelist today is Dr. Robert Maury. Robert was named the Alan J. Dworsky Curator of Chinese Art Emeritus on his retirement in early 2013. Bob worked at the Harvard Art Museums for more than 37 years, on and off, and more than 25 of those years as one of the museum's senior curatorial staff. Robert Maury previously served as the founding curator of the Mrs. and Mr. John D. Rockefeller III collection at the Asia Society in New York and before that as assistant curator of oriental art at Harvard's Fog Art Museum. His two years working as a Peace Corps volunteer in the Republic of Korea sparked his interest in Asian art and culture. He did his graduate work at the University of Kansas, studying with Lawrence Sickman and Chu Sing Lee, after which he spent two years as a curatorial assistant and translator at the Department of Painting and Calligraphy at the National Palace Museum, Taipei. As a specialist in Chinese art, he also does research on Korean art his best known publication is Hare's Fur, Tortoise Shell, and Partridge Feather, Chinese Brown and Black Glaze Ceramics, 400 to 1400. The catalog of his 1995 exhibition that opened at Harvard's Arthur M. Sacker Museum in 1995. Appointed the National Museum of Korea's Senior International Fellow, he currently serves as the senior editor of that museum's scholarly journal. And in September 2013, Christie's New York engaged Dr. Maori as senior consultant on Chinese and Korean art. In that capacity, he lectures, does research on important individual works of art, and writes scholarly notes and essays for our catalogs. Each of our panelists today has prepared um, an opening statement and a, a, a presentation on either their development as a connoisseur or a situation in which their connoisseurial skills were put to the test. After they've presented, we will hold a quick discussion and then open the panel up to questions from the room. And with that, I would like to turn the podium over to Dr. Knight. Mm -hmm. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Mahai, Christie's, and everybody involved with this uh, program. Can we have the lights off of there so people can see what we're looking at? Thank you. 
I'm spending other people's money, and it gets to be really important that you think you know what you're talking about when you do that. Uh, Bob and Alice, they spend their own money. They need to know what they're talking about as well. <laughs> but when you're spending other people's money, and the next your job continuing along the line is kind of based on doing the right thing, I guess it's important as well. This is a pair of cabinets that I bought for, I found at the Seattle Art Museum and purchased in 1989. That was before Chinese furniture went crazy. Matter of fact, I paid less than $90,000 for this pair of cabinets. I expect you pay a couple million dollars for them now if you were to try to buy them. So as that kind of market moves along, of course, the, the pressure is to be good at what you're doing, but also the pressure is from people to create things to fit into that market to kind of go hand in hand. In other words, there are getting to be some really good fakes out there of uh, good Wamali furniture. And that's what I'm going to talk about is this Wamali furniture as we go along. And I'm going to look at it in break this down to make it kind of sensible uh, how I would look at a piece as I was to go and look at it at, a, at an auction or at a dealer. Uh, I'm going to look at a number of pieces, and use a number of pieces, but I'm going to look at it starting off with forms. And we can find the forms for most Chinese furniture either in uh, period, period pictorial arts. This is the Lu Banqing, that's a, a, a manual on architecture and furniture making. And if you look at the Lubanjing, I think you can see here we've got some forms that are probably pretty close to being being right. And we've got this piece that's pretty much like this one. This has got a lot to do with this one. So we can find the forms. You can find the forms also if you know the field and you, you've gone around and looked at furniture. There can be pieces in museums or the pieces that are published. The great Wang Shishang and published so many other, other great pieces of furniture and kind of set the standard for understanding and knowing the forms. So that's where you start, is knowing the basic forms of the furniture that would have been available, would have been made at any given time. Just a note about forms on Chinese furniture. Uh, the Chinese sat on a raised chair, so everything is elevated. So both of these tables are within kind of 32 to 33 inches tall. If things are shorter than that, then you need to start getting suspicious about what's going on on the piece. So the forms are always going to be a little taller than on Western furniture. That first group of collectors in the West, uh, post-war, post-Second World War, often they cut the pieces off. And there was a large collection in Seattle that I saw marvelous pieces, but they'd all been cut down about six to ten inches, so they were no longer really viable for a museum collection. Materials. The wood that I'm talking about mostly, I don't like to talk about mostly, is Huang Hua Li, which is an exotic hardwood. A lot of specialists say this is hardwood. But actually, elm is also a hardwood. This is an exotic hardwood. It was a hardwood that was imported into China. It was not a domestic material. It was a material that came in from someplace else. It's a, it's a rosewood. It's a tropical wood. It was imported. We know from texts, uh, Ming Dynasty texts, that it started to show up in China in fair amounts in the mid and late 1500s, so the later part of the 16th century. And it was, there was such a huge market for it that the trees seemed to have pretty well logged out by the later part of the 17th and 18th century. As you get into the 18th century, you begin to run out of trees, and they begin to reuse the material. So you, you, you identify the wood, but it also helps you, in, particularly in groups of pieces, to look closely at each of the objects in that group. So if you look, I hope you can see, the lights are still a little bright, but if you look at the back splats on this wonderful pair of horseshoe back chairs, they're from the same piece of wood. So they match up. In order to do that, you had to have a pretty big piece of wood, and also you had to be very clever about what you were doing. They didn't bend their wood, they actually cut it. So they were cutting these pieces out of a single log, and they were getting them match up. And this, is, this, you know, this can go over a number of sets. And if you look at them, you can tell where they're going down that log, where that piece of wood would have come out of the sequence. The same is true on this pair of cabinets. If you look at the front, so you can see these, book, these pieces of wood were actually hook matched like this. They were actually cut open. And this is the same face coming from both sides, ditto here. And the woods actually match all the way around the sides of that piece. There are secondary woods in the back, but the woods match front doors and on the side. So these pieces were definitely made as a set. They weren't put together later. There's not pieces of, bar piece of wood borrowed from another source. They're put together as a set because the woods match. They come from the same tree. So that's a pretty good indication that these were made at least in the same period. Secondary materials. If you've ever watched people working on Chinese furniture, people looking at Chinese furniture, you go to the auctions, you go to a dealer, they're always crawling around underneath the furniture, picking it up and doing terrible things to it, and they're looking at the bottoms. And that's important because the secondary materials uh, give you pretty good, can give you basic ideas about the, the dates of the piece. So if you look at, this is the bottom of a really truly wonderful table, it looks kind of messy. 
Well, Wahwali, all woods move. Wahwali being a very dense uh, tropical hardwood, moves a lot with changes in humidity and heat. And in order to mitigate that, that movement, the Chinese lacquer, the Chinese artisans covered the base with a coat of lacquer, fabric, lacquer, fabric, and clay. So there are very thick coatings on the bottom of the, uh, many of these pieces. That would have been done at the period, and that was to keep the piece stable, to keep it from breaking. So if you're looking at a piece of furniture, you're looking at a piece of main, main furniture, you go underneath it, you look at it, you see a, bit, a nice coat of lacquer. That's at least an indication that it might be genuine, it might be at the period. The stuff is pretty easily faked as well. And that's also one of the things you have to know about almost any art form. It's a constant race between the connoisseur and the faker. As soon as I say, if you look at the bottom of this, of this piece of furniture, it needs to have a piece of old, some old lacquer on it, and I publish that. Well, the faker knows that as well, and he's going to start making that kind of lacquer and putting it on the bottom as well. Other things you'll look for, caning, well, most caning, these pieces are used, they're going to wear out, the caning's going to go away. But the evidence for the caning, this is a nice one for bench, the evidence for the caning would have been attached is there. So we get a pretty good idea that there's always a cane to pick up these with cane. And then there's a whole level of connoisseurship that goes with the brasses and the fittings that would have gone on uh, these various pieces of furniture and some marbles. Again, you can see that there was a book match, so they're from the same piece of wood. All of these brasses, all the fittings that go on, again, people collect those separately. Uh, there is a whole kind of idiom that goes with that as well. Workmanship. How many of you actually work with wood at all? So there's a, there's a few here, Bob. Uh, I do, and, and I always uh, am I'm stunned by what these people were doing. Uh, this is a very hard and dense wood, which actually makes it relatively easy to work. It doesn't collapse as you're working it, but it also takes really sharp tools and really great control. So they obviously had very good chisels, very good, very good planes. They had sharp tools. You don't cut this stuff without a sharp tool. With that, what they had, had available, they were doing wonderful things. If you understand how a piece works, then you can start to tell some issues that uh, for both condition and for authenticity. So, as I think Andrew was saying, most of the work is mortise and tenon. So, if you look at this, this, this leg is going, well, this arm is going, leg is going into the top rail here. It's actually got a pipe joint that goes in there. That's going to be a weak spot on this, on this chair. Uh, this is going to be mortise, mortise and tenon here fit in. That's going to be another weak spot on this. This is a weak spot. Look for damage there. Uh, you can see tenons coming through down here at the bottom, so that the, 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 uh, this is on the bottom, or through tenon and so on. A very complicated joint on any piece of furniture is where you join a horizontal surface with a vertical surface. You lift on the horizontal on the, on the horizontal surface, it's going to come off the vertical surface. You have to figure out a way to actually hook it on it. So these joins right in here are very, very complicated. If you were to look at this, you can see this looks like on the top, but it's a simple miter joint until you look right here and you go underneath, and it's not a miter joint at all. What's happened is a piece of this, it's mitered, it's, the miter is concealing a piece of this that comes through the other piece of the rail, so you can see it right there. And then as you look at the bottom, what they've done is they've taken a series of dovetailed pegs that run, sliding, sliding dovetail pegs that hold the, the aprons and the tops in place. So there's clever ways of keeping these things from moving around. Again, you need to look underneath, you need to understand joinery, you need to understand what they're doing, because that joinery did change over time. Uh, as you get into the Qing Dynasty, different kinds of joints, different that they need to produce things faster, different kinds of woods, not as elaborate joinery. Um, when they were not as confident of the material, it tended to be heavy. When the material got rarer, it tends to be thinner. So you can date, get a guess at the dates, work at the dates, by looking at the workmanship and at the nature of the materials. Ornamentation, surface ornamentation, uh, and there's a lot to be said about that. And some of it you can look and say, well, that's a, I can see that kind of dragon on a late name vase or something, and say, okay, that that okay, it's consistent with a late name date. So that helps me date this piece by looking at the surface ornamentation. On this particular piece, something meant uh, for use on a, on a platform, on a con, uh, somebody came along later and added some uh, really wonderful little bits of brass on there kind of going right over the carved decoration. So this is an interesting piece that's been uh, reworked, or actually the brass has been added. And then of course the dealer said, well, that's proof that it was an imperial collection. <coughs> uh, things like beading, uh, molding along the edges like this. Uh, may not look like much, may look pretty simple, but look at this. The whole surface behind here has been removed. 
in order to leave that little bead along the edge. Now in later times, what they did is they actually cut, they beveled it in. So you would have, that would be a simpler and easier way to do this, but in this case they removed all of it. That's sacrificing a lot of material. So that's, a, 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 again, a evidence from workmanship of the dating and the importance of the piece. I see a hand being raised back there. Uh, yeah, um, I don't know whether I'm having trouble, but when you're talking through the screen, you can't hear what you're saying. Okay, sorry. Is, maybe if I pick this up, does that help a little bit? All right, very good. All right, there we go. So here again, you can see that this has this piece, this the side piece here. Again, this is a this is a concealed miter, and there's a miter that's concealing an actual joint with the, this piece coming through here, showing through here. That's work. That's a uh, piece of wonderful piece of workmanship. This is from the first collection of Chinese furniture that I got to deal with. This was somebody who had been in the war uh, in Beijing at the end of the Second World War and had bought Chinese furniture from Harry Hochstadter, who's well known for his uh, Chinese paintings, but also had Chinese furniture. So this was collected somewhere between 45 and 48, and I was able to add this to the collection in Seattle in 1985. So this was amongst that first group. And here again, you can see some uh, surface ornamentation that you can compare to other arts of the time and give a, get a pretty good idea of when the object might be dated to. Overall condition. Uh, Furniture, more than probably, um, certainly as much as any other uh, art form, is used. People sit on it. People sleep on it. People eat on it. It gets used. Um, you know, pieces get broken. So the discussion becomes, how good does the piece have to be before you want to buy it? Because there's always going to be, the surface is going to be changed, it's going to be stripped at some point or another. You're not going to have a piece that has survived for four or five hundred years that's in original condition. That just doesn't happen. So what you're looking at then, as far as condition goes, is, is it good enough? And what are evidences uh, of how much it's been repaired? How do you see how much it's been repaired? And then, how do you decide then if it's a piece you want to own? So again, as we're, maybe I'll back up. No, I won't back up. If you're looking at things like this, this, these kinds of curved areas right here, think about if that was broken and you had to replace it, uh, you had wanted to cut that joint down, well, that curve would no longer work. So that's an indication, if the curve is actually working very well, that's an indication that those two pieces were made as, as one unit. So there's some clues as you go looking through, if you, if you know what you're, if you're, what you're looking for and what you're looking at, there's an indication here that these were always together, so that those joints have not been recut. If you're going to recut it, the proportions wouldn't be right. Um, seats, well, they broke and they fell out uh, and they got replaced. So this is the bottom of that wonderful pair of horseshoe, uh, one of the wonderful pair of horseshoe chairs that we saw uh, early on. And you can see, well, there's still the areas for the caning to be attached, but the caning's no longer there. This board has been added and the cross braces have been replaced and some person who did this had read that, uh, well, they needed to be lacquered, so they added a layer of lacquer on the bottom to make it look old, but it's not old. This is a replacement. The question gets to be, is the piece wonderful enough that you say, okay, this is a replacement, it's going to be, I'll buy it anyway. Sometimes overall condition can help you say this is a piece that you do want to buy, or a piece of damage on a piece made to tell you that this is really something that you want to have. So if you look at the bottom of a piece of furniture, all of, the, all of you that have been in China, particularly in the Suzhou, that non, non, uh, Nanjiang area, they live on tile floors, the floors are wet, wood rots. Uh, so you look at the bottom of a piece of furniture, if there isn't any rot on the legs, you've probably got a piece that's pretty new or something's been done to it to replace that. So if you look at the bottom of this, you can see there's a lot of rot going on there, uh, on the bottoms of these. And if you were to say, well, Okay, that means this piece is not as great as it might be. Well, no, that means this piece has been around. It really has some age to it. Of course, what's going to happen is over time, that rod's going to get bad enough, they're going to cut it down. So you're going to, you're going to lose a little bit of the height of a piece over time. So that's, that's a kind of a natural process. Surface. Um, and that's something that actually has to do with, with taste, uh, that uh, kind of subjective part of connoisseurship. In the... 70s, 80s, and maybe even into the 90s in Hong Kong, certainly in the 70s and 80s, the taste was to really strip the furniture, to get it right down through the original wood, to take off all the, all the signs of age and make it look as new as possible. 
personally, I love the wood, so being able to see the grain in such, in such a fashion is, is appealing to me. But what it did was remove all signs of age. And that was certainly true for this pair of cabinets. Basically, they've been stripped. So you can really see the wood, but there's very little signs of the age of the piece or of the that kind of surface build up a surface that comes over time now this is a, a wonderful little little table uh, one of the table we saw at the beginning and if you look at it uh, from the side view you can see again layers of surface that have built up over being refinished and used and worn um, the top uh, also shows many many signs of being worn now here's a case though where you have to be very careful, this kind of patination in, in general. Um, as soon as it became popular to have pieces patinated with patina, they began to be patinated. So if somebody says, well, during the Cultural Revolution, all this furniture was used and abused, and it's going to have cigarette burns, and it's going to have spots where they put hot pots on it and so on. Of course, fakers are going to do that because that shows that it was around during the Cultural Revolution, and that gives at least that kind of a provenance. So this kind of patination you need to look at very, very carefully because that can be added quite easily and can be there to trick you rather than to give something, uh, some idea of the authenticity of the object. So those are the kind of criteria that I go through. And now when I do this, now when I'm working for a client, I give a number to each one of these areas. Um, you know, the materials are really great. I give it a, a 9.5. Uh, the overall condition is pretty good. I give it an 8. And we average that all out and um, based on that, and then going back and forth and discussing it, we decide whether or not we're going to pursue the piece. And then it goes for $2 million and we forget it anyway. <laughs> the other thing that is important about any art form uh, is talking to other people, to people, other people who might have a different perspective. A lot of the work that's been done on Chinese furniture has been done by dealers. And they handle a lot of stock. And they're very, very good. So you, if you have a dealer who specializes in Chinese furniture, certainly talk to them. Talk to them about pieces that are not in their collection, if you're, and they're things that they're not trying to sell. Talking to a dealer about things they're trying to sell, it's like turning the fox loose in the chicken coop. You can't. But they do have very good, good criteria and reasons to say this. You know, they have a ways of looking at furniture and saying this is good enough. Thank you. Good afternoon. I'm Bob Mowry, and um, uh, I thank Nanhai Gallery, I thank everyone involved uh, for arranging this wonderful symposium, and certainly thank all of you for coming and for your interest. Now, again, I will be addressing the problems of connoisseurship. Uh, many people, have, or our uh, panelists and scholars, have addressed issues of uh, authenticity and such, uh, quality, condition. I'll be looking at another aspect of connoisseurship, and that is dating. Uh, now, in many cases, uh, it's sort of assumed that, well, hasn't everything been pretty precisely dated? Uh, not whether it's a fake or a copy or something like that, but the general bounds for this type of wear. Don't we know that it's Northern Song? Don't we know that it's Ming? Don't we know that it's from the early 15th century? Yes, in many cases we do. But with the so-called numbered June wear, uh, which I will address uh, today. Uh, this is a big issue. Now, uh, there are, you can turn the lights down there in the front. Uh, <clears throat> there are those who, until recently at least, uh, have thought it was Northern Song. There are those who think it's Ming. There are those who think it's Jin Dynasty. Uh, a, a, um, a chronological range that covers many centuries. Is it Northern Song, Jin, Yuan, Ming? Is it Romanesque, Gothic? early Renaissance, late Renaissance, Mannerist, uh, how often do we encounter this kind of a problem? Well, one sort of assumes, well, uh, hasn't somebody figured this out? No. How did this come about uh, until now? I think we've solved it. But on the basis of connoisseurship, how did this come about? Well, there are no records, at least we haven't uncovered any exactly yet, as to exactly when these were made, obviously, and when they first came into the imperial uh, collection. But they were first sort of recognized and taken note of uh, in the 18th century with the Qianlong Emperor. And looking at them, he saw the sort of purple color, the blue color, and thought, well, they must be Junware. Uh, Junware, as everyone knows, dates to the Song Dynasty. So, they're Song Dynasty. 
uh, and that was the uh, that was the accepted attribution uh, through the 19th century. But at the beginning of the 20th century, there began to be arguments in China among scholars saying this: this simply can't be Northern Song. It wasn't based on stylistic analysis so much as just looking look at the bright colors. Uh, Song wares are celebrated for their subtly hued monochrome glazes, ding ware, celadon ware, uh, and such. Uh, or in June wear, just the soft blue, sometimes with a splash of purple. These, by contrast, are quite different. So there began to be discussion in the early 20th century in China. Well, then, of course, comes the fall of the Qing dynasty. There is the period of warlordism. Scholarship is not so much pursued in this area. Then somehow, with the establishment of the People's Republic of China, a northern Song attribution became an article of Chinese citizenship. They are Bei Song. Uh, and then you ask why. Because they're Bei Song. That is northern Song. Uh, and so that was sort of accepted for a while. By contrast, in Taiwan, at the National Palace Museum, and with other scholars there, they were much more hesitant, that is to say. We're not sure what they are. Maybe they're Northern Song, maybe they're Yuan, maybe they're Ming. We don't know. We'll have to study this farther. And so they're really unclear. Uh, it turns out that we in the West are really the ones who have uh, who've jumped into this. Uh, my own background in connoisseurship, I was trained with uh, Chu Tsing Li in Chinese painting and Lawrence Sickman uh, at the Nelson Gallery. Uh, I was at the National Palace Museum, as Andrew said, working with uh, uh, John Gao Shun uh, in the painting department. And then later, uh, I had the good fortune to have sort of an intensive uh, month of training uh, with Margaret Medley and, uh, and John Ayres in London. How did I become interested in the number Junwear problem? Well, simply because most of my career has been with the Harvard Art Museums, and they're fortunate to have some 70 pieces of number Junwear. Naturally, I took a real interest in it, and how, what is this? Can we figure it out? Uh, so that's a little background on that. Uh, now, I'll go through and talk about what are they for, why, why are they called number Junwear, um, how did they come to be called this and that, and we'll see if we can solve the matter. So now, uh, first of all, I think everyone in this room knows what Junwear is. When we think about Junwear, we usually think of the Song Dynasty Junwear, uh, with the light gray stoneware body, the pale and very beautiful, very appealing uh, light blue glaze, as you see there. Certainly by the 12th century and the Jin period, they sometimes wanted to enliven the surface uh, because it's a more or less opaque glaze. It really couldn't be uh, decorated with incised, carved, or mold decoration, like uh, Yao ware, Ding ware, and things like that. But they discovered if they added splashes of copper uh, to the glaze before firing, those areas that received the copper would turn this beautiful purple color uh, in the firing. So those are typical of what we might call early or classic June ware from the Northern Song and uh, the Jin period. Not only are these the colors, but notice that the shapes in general are relatively small, and in general they are food-serving vessels. They are bowls, plates, uh, an occasional bottle here that was probably a bottle for serving wine. Oops, um, what happened? Oh, I know. Okay, I cut one slide out. Anyway, uh, uh, vessels for uh, wine, food, occasionally a bottle for, um, uh, for serving wine. By contrast, these so-called numbered June pieces are quite different. They are large. They are often bold in their coloring, and they're not for food or wine at all. Uh, they are flower pots, as you see there, with an associated basin uh, to catch any uh, overflow of water uh, that descends from the pot. Uh, here is the view of that same uh, flower pot taken out of its basin. Uh, and then here is uh, uh, a view of the interior of the pot. And you see that there are five holes, and there are usually uh, five holes. They are not drilled subsequent to firing. They are integral with the manufacture of the piece, and they're always in this particular uh, arrangement. Uh, we know that they are integral with the manufacture of the piece because glaze runs into the holes, not filling the holes, but it glazes and covers the sides of the walls uh, in the uh, in the holes. Subsequently, some of the holes have been filled with a substance like that uh, in many of these pieces. We don't know why uh, or exactly when, uh, but that's, uh, that's the situation there. Uh, here is the association, the same pot, the same basin. Uh, and you see that uh, in a set, and Harvard is fortunate to have four sets. Uh, the sets are rare to begin with, and to have four is otherwise unheard of. But when we say a set, 
what do we mean? Well, first of all, it's going to be the same general shape uh, with the barbed rim, the low walls, uh, and such. Uh, number two, it will have exactly the same color scheme. If it's purple on the outside, turquoise on the inside, so will it be the associated vessel. As we'll see in the course of the lecture, there's some that are purple all over, there's some that are blue all over, so there's a good deal of variation. And then the third uh, thing for a set, of course, is the number. When we say numbered Junware, and I'll show you in a slide uh, in just a moment, there is a Chinese numeral from 1 to 10 stamped on the base before firing. Uh, for a long time, it wasn't know what, uh, known what the number was, uh, but we now uh, are almost certain that it's the number of the shape uh, for easy pairing of basin and flower pot. This is looking into the flower pot on the right, into the associated basin on the left. Once again, you see the same uh, interpretation of the shape, uh, the same coloring. This is the base of the flower pot, just the underside. Uh, so that you're not only seeing the five holes, uh, but there is the number three. Uh, and the number three also appears on the base uh, of the basin. Uh, the base is glazed, not the bottom of the foot ring, but the base is glazed. It's a very, very thin coating of the same blue glaze uh, that occurred on the interior, uh, but when it's applied so thinly, it often fires this kind of olive color that you see there. Uh, here you see it up close, uh, you see the, uh, the perforations to let water drain out, you see the number, uh, and, uh, and such. Uh, that's the underside of the basin, uh, it's a very similar, uh, but also with the three little cloud form legs uh, that you see there. Uh, now, uh, going on, uh, like I said, uh, we have four sets at Harvard. Uh, there is this one. There is this one of circular shape and a circular uh, basin with so-called drum head nail decoration. Uh, here's a rectangular one, strictly with blue glaze. Uh, and here's a purple one, but also with uh, a blue interior in quatrophile shape, more or less resembling uh, an open blossom. Now many people would say, but I thought the shape like this was a, either a brush washer or a narcissus bulb bowl. Well, they were repurposed as Narcissus bulb bowls uh, when the flower pot got broken uh, or otherwise disappeared. Uh, they might be used as a brush brush on a scholar's desk for a very large brush or often used, as you see in the painting there, I couldn't find the painting I wanted, but that will suffice, uh, uh, as a Narcissus bulb bowl. So there you see the situation, the, the large flower pot, which probably would have had planted in it. Uh, a panzai or uh, bonsai, using the Japanese term, or possibly a flowering plant, a chrysanthemum, or something like that. Uh, when that uh, disappeared, the bowl was left. They were considered precious, so of course they were repurposed. What happens if a flower pot is damaged? Well, if it's not too severely damaged, it will be repurposed as well. This began life as a uh, flower pot with the trumpet mouth, like we just saw. The top got broken off, so they cut it down. Uh, and then they banded the cut area with metal, and it could serve as an incense burner or perfumer. Uh, if you look at the inside and underside of that, you see it has the five holes. Uh, it has a, a number over there, uh, sort of the bottom of the screen. Uh, it's just been cut down. So, um, yeah. Where did these come from? Well, we don't know exactly where they all came from, but for the most part, they came uh, from uh, Yujo. Uh, city area, which is about uh, 50 some miles to the south southwest uh, of Zhengzhou, uh, there on the map. Uh, now, like I said, in terms of the historical development, in the Song Dynasty, the northern Song, they're basically uh, this very pale blue, usually without any decoration. Or here's a beautiful uh, flat uh, dish, uh, once again, very representative of the type. In the Jin Dynasty, in order to enliven the pieces, as I mentioned, they would often add the purple or the copper to produce the purple splashes, sometimes using it more extensively, uh, covering the entire exterior uh, with copper on top of the glaze, uh, but it just comes across around the rim of the piece. But it's a very different looking purple. It's a very homogeneous, very even uh, appearance to the purple uh, from what we get in the number to and wear. Uh, or here is one a famous piece in the David Collection now at the British Museum in London. Uh, probably a bottle rather than a vase uh, for uh, serving wine, uh, with the blue glaze uh, and the purple splashes, which are purple, but with a certain undercurrent of gray uh, to it that we really don't see in the numbered pieces. 
So then you jump into the realm of the number tune wear, and you see why it is so different uh, from the so-called classic or early tune wares. Now, uh, how do we try to unravel uh, when they remain? Well, uh, uh, as I often tell my students, or used to tell my students before I retired uh, from teaching, that in some ways modern connoisseurship uh, is much like uh, a medical diagnosis. Uh, when you're a physician, at least I presume, uh, when you're a physician uh, looking at an illness, uh, you're looking at the various symptoms and how they present themselves. Well, instead of dealing with in a work of art, we don't call them symptoms, we call them characteristics or uh, features, <laughs> uh, but they are kindred kinds of things. Uh, so a physician, a physician will examine the patient, uh, take note of all of the physical symptoms or characteristics, uh, but will also look at laboratory tests and any other data that might be available, then put it all together to try to come up with the best uh, possible diagnosis. The same thing here. Uh, with art history, particularly looking at ceramics, uh, we have to look at the aesthetics. Uh, it was the aesthetics in the, the early 20th century of these pieces that made scholars think these are too bold in their coloration to be northern so they have to be later but when and then no one quite had an answer um, uh, but in addition you might think well what about scientific tests what about uh, archaeological evidence well uh, yes some <coughs> of the number of gem pieces have been excavated but never with sound evidence to say when they date only enough evidence to say where they came from not to say exactly when they date. Now, that's not to say that one day archaeology won't solve the problem. It might, and with luck it will, and definitively at that. The point is, it hasn't yet, so we're still left with connoisseurship. Scholars are still, well, uh, scientific laboratories are doing some TL testing, uh, and they are coming up, uh, as I previously had, uh, on the basis of connoisseurship, with a main date uh, for the pieces. But just looking at the aesthetics, that bold use of purple, is sort of kindred, uh, in speaking about Ming, to the use of copper and to the taste for red. Uh, we see the perfection of underglazed copper red in a piece like that. Or the gorgeous red glazes, uh, which uh, you would never get in a song piece. But more importantly, the method of manufacture, and this is what many, many people didn't pay attention to in the past. And this is one of the things that I learned in working with Lawrence Sickman, and certainly in studying with Margaret Medley uh, at the David Foundation in London. Now, something like this. You notice that there is a barbed rim, uh, as the number of Chu and Fai pots have barbed rims. But it's not just barbed, it's raised at the edge. In addition, when you look at the designs here, uh, the uh, elements in white, they rise in low relief above the cobalt blue ground. That certainly indicates that it was produced with a mold, uh, but it was produced with a single-faced hump mold, not this mold, which is a different kind of wear, but it's fired clay placed in the center of the potter's wheel. The potter shapes the piece over the mold. Uh, the mold determines the basic shape of the piece, uh, the diameter, and it imparts the, um, uh, the barbed edge uh, and the, uh, the raised lip around that edge. But then, uh, put them together, you can see, uh, the exterior is shaped by the potter's hands, uh, as, the, as the potter's hands determine the thickness of the wall. So it's a pump mold in the center of the potter's wheel. Uh, when, and here's the, uh, uh, the two faces together. And that's typical, uh, as we see in 14th century blue and white porcelain. Now, when we look at these, these obviously are produced with molds, but it's something different. Look how the interior uh, uh, points, indentations, are mirrored on the exterior. This is nothing but it would be extremely difficult to do anything like that by hand. Uh, when we think about it, the first evidence that we see of this kind of thing, it's a different process of molding. It's referred to as a press mold, uh, where you have an inner face and an outer face to the mold. Uh, you have the inner face, you take the clay, you put it over it, and you take the outer mold and you push them together. And that produces uh, the, um, uh, exactly the same profile, if you will, on the exterior, the lobing, if you will, on the exterior and the interior. Now the first that we see of this in Chinese ceramics is in the Hongwu period, the first reign of the Ming Dynasty. Now I have to say that Margaret Medley was the first to talk about this, the use of a press mold. Uh, for creating the number Junwei. And she said categorically, and I think she is absolutely right, that the press mold simply was not used until the late Yuan, the beginning of the Ming period. 
meaning that based on the technique of manufacture, the number of number of June pieces could not have been produced before the late or mid to late 14th century. Um, now, then I've taken it from there. Now, when you compare these, uh, you see that the lobing is there, uh, the barbed rim is there, and everything. But one essential difference: uh, the hongo pieces resolve themselves in a circular foot ring. Look at the number of June pieces. It is a much, much more elaborate foot ring that exactly echoes the barbing of the lip. The first time we see that uh, in Chinese ceramics that can be dated with certainty are in the Xuanda period uh, of the Ming Dynasty, an imperial reign. This is a brush washer from the Xuanda period. You're looking at the interior, that's the exterior. Look at the shaping of the foot ring. Or here's another famous example, also Xuanda period as you see from the mark, uh, where the, uh, the uh, shaping of the walls continues directly into the foot ring. Now, you put it together here, and you realize that uh, there is a, a correspondence uh, in the shape of that very, very elaborate foot ring uh, and the foot ring of the brush washer. Now, they are produced at different kilns, meaning that they're not necessarily produced at exactly the same time. However, they're probably relatively close together, and of course this kind of shaping <coughs> might have started at Jingdezhen in the Yongle period instead of the Shunda period. Uh, but the first evidence we really have of that kind of elaborate foot ring, where the entire piece has been shaped uh, with a press mold, rather than most of it, and then the foot ring cut by hand, is in Shunda. So I think that alone begins to allow us to put the number of Jun pieces into the early 15th century. Uh, and this is a discovery that I made after much looking, thinking, and uh, comparing. But another realm that I came up with just a few years ago, uh, these are flower vases. Technically, they're not usually numbered. Sometimes they are. Uh, but technically, they're not usually numbered like the flower uh, pots and basins. But they seem to be made at the same time. Now, and I think they're from the same date. Now, looking at something like this, of course, it's modeled on an archaic bronze Zun wine vessel. Uh, from the uh, late Shang or Western Zhou period, uh, the trumpet mouth, uh, the uh, articulated central knob, and the flaring base, and of course the emphasis on these large flanges. Now you put them side by side and you see that the relationship is clear. But it's not just in the ceramic ware that we get these, uh, certainly in other media from the early 15th century, uh, such as this wonderful uh, Quasine piece, uh, which uh, first half of the 15th century is very similar to that, the view of the interior, but then side by side, and you realize, yes, these simply can't date to the Northern Song period, uh, whether the flower vases, vases, whether the flower pots, whatever. They're, these are very, very rare. There are probably only two or three in the United States. Uh, uh, the previous one uh, uh, was uh, uh, in a foreign collection. Uh, this is here in the Asian Art Museum. This is in the Shanghai Museum. Uh, we have a damaged one at Harvard that I'll show you uh, in a moment. Uh, this is one that was excavated. It was uh, damaged, probably damaged at the time of uh, firing, and that's the reason it remained back at the kiln site. Uh, but it's been recovered from the kiln site, it's been restored, uh, and there it is. But again, with no particular evidence of, of when it was made, just the location there, uh, about 50 miles southwest of Zhengzhou. Now, putting these in historical perspective, you ask, well, could they be Northern Song, uh, just on the basis of shape, style? When we look at ones that are reliably dated to Northern Song, or more likely, such as this one, to the Yuan Dynasty, uh, of course, uh, you have the shape, which is a twin shape. You recognize it from the flaring lip, the tripartite division, the flanges. But it's a very different interpretation of the shape. And it, in addition, the flanges play a very small role. Uh, compared to those in the um, the uh, Claudine enamel or the uh, number June type. Another major difference is that in a piece like this, the floor of the vessel goes all the way to the bottom. So if you turn over uh, the vessel, look at the underside, the base that you see down there is the floor of the vessel. If you put water in it as a vase, the water goes all the way down there. Or here's another one from the Yuan period, uh, same general type, if you will. Uh, based on an archaic uh, Zuan wine vessel, tripart division, little flanges, uh, the base down at the bottom. Now, this is something different altogether. Uh, Ming Dynasty, these are hard to date. These are very, very, very rare. They never have rain marks, uh, but they have to date, I think, into the first half of the 15th century. 
Uh, but look at that. Uh, when we put these side by side, we suddenly see a ceramic type uh, that is very clear, uh, that is very, excuse me, that is a Ming type and definitely not a Song or <coughs> Yuan type. But there is one more thing uh, that relates these very closely. Uh, in this uh, period, that is in the first part of the 15th century, and the interpretation of the vessel, the floor of the vessel is here. If you put water into it, the water will stop there because that's where the floor is. Of the course, the base is hollow. It's not just hollow following the form of the, ba of the base, but it is dome-shaped. And then one of the things I discovered accidentally, but suddenly it clicked, this has exactly the same uh, the way of modus operandi, if you will. The floor is there, it's hollow, and it's dome. Now, I will show you. Uh, that's what I mean. You turn it over, and there is the dome shape uh, uh, for this particular vessel. Sadly, you're looking at the underside here, but the photographer didn't understand exactly what I wanted in having this photograph taken. Photographs the underside head on instead of tipping the piece, and we get what looks like a cylinder, uh, but it's domed just like the previous one was. And so you'll have to take my word for it, but uh, <laughs> they're closely related. <laughs> Believe me. Uh, related. Uh, anyway, uh, once you realize that, you realize, once again, these come from different kilns, but they must date to the same period. We're almost at the end. When one moves on just a little bit later in time to the one Lee period, 17th century, again, the exact interpretation changes. It becomes elongated. The flanges become more vestigial uh, than bold and assertive. But in addition, when we look at the underside of that piece, once again, the base, the flat floor, drops all the way to the bottom. Uh, so that if you put, when you put it right side up, put water in it, the water will go all the way to the bottom. Now, uh, like I said, we do have one at Harvard. The base, not the, not the top, but the base of this somehow was broken at some point, and it was uh, uh, cut down. So it doesn't have quite the proper proportions to it, uh, but you realize that in the same way that the, uh, uh, the uh, basins were repurposed as Narcissus bolt holes, uh, these weren't just tossed out if they got broken. Uh, they were cut down and still made usable, or perhaps turned into a sensor like this one, which is just the central portion and a portion of the base uh, of one of these dune-shaped uh, vases. And then the very last slide is just to say, uh, so far we've been dealing with uh, <clears throat> the dating, if you will, uh, of authentic pieces. And when do they date? And I'm sure they must date uh, to the uh, first part of the 15th century. But on the market are appearing ones like this. Uh, this is an obvious, uh, whether it's a fake or whether it's say, something inspired by antiquity, it's hard to say. Uh, but if they can do these, they're certainly uh, now doing ones that are much, much better. Uh, what I would say is that uh, in conclusion, and this is pure speculation now, uh, without anything to back it up. Believe me, I'm working on it, uh, but nothing <laughs> to back it up yet. That is, you think, why were these, why are they so homogeneous? Why, why do we have all of these? There are not a lot of them worldwide. Like I say, at Harvard, we have more than 70 of the numbered June pieces. Uh, it is much of the old imperial collection, which ended up at Harvard legally, although uh, <laughs> maybe not happily from some points of view. It's illegally. They're not looted or anything like that. Uh, but uh, most museums are lucky to have a few of numbered June pieces. Uh, like I say, we have four sets and things like that. But you realize worldwide, there are not a lot of these. Uh, why do they all date to the 15th century? Why don't they seem to be over a span of time? Uh, one of the things I'm looking into, trying to prove, doing research on is, I think they were probably made specifically for the palace. When you think, what happened in the early 15th century? Well, of course, during the Yongle period, for the first time, the Forbidden City opens in the Yongle reign, the 1420s. Now, whether they date to the 1420s, the number of June pieces, or whether they date just a little bit later, uh, uh, when a new hall was opened at the Forbidden City, I don't know. My speculation is that they were an imperial commission from the Forbidden City, specifically for the palace. Uh, therefore, they were made in one giant uh, commission, if you will. Uh, that's why they're so homogeneous. That's why most of them have traditionally been associated with the palace, uh, rather than scattered uh, every place uh, else. And um, uh, but because they were household decoration, if you will, 
Uh, they weren't taken seriously, probably, for a long time. Uh, they were put into a storeroom here, a storeroom there. Finally, probably, during the, the uh, uh, Chenlong reign, they were suddenly discovered and decided that these are works of Arthur Jun where they're northern song. And here we are trying to unravel the mystery today. Thank you very much.